Oh, boring! Not another video about dash cams! After reading the comments I've received under recent dash cam reviews, it seems not too many people are interested in the idea of me doing many more of these. But in this one, I'm going to show you the dash cam that I've installed in my car. Now, this is a Smart Roadster Coupe. If you don't know what one of those looks like, they stopped making them 10 years ago, but I'll show you a picture of it now. It's a very small car and therefore it has a very small windscreen on the front which means there isn't an awful lot of space in which to put a dash cam without it interrupting the line of sight. So I need a small dash cam that'll fit up behind the rear view mirror. I don't need it to have an LCD screen on it because I won't be able to see it where I'm installing it but it'd be quite nice perhaps if it had a Wi-Fi connectivity then I could change the settings without having to try and move around the mirror. Also, I quite like the idea of having one with a quick release mount, so if you park the vehicle in somewhere where you think somebody might have a go at it because it's got a dash cam in it, you can quickly remove it, take it out and put it back in again just as quickly later on. And I also like the idea of it having a good parking mode. I've got my battery installed in the car now, which enables the cameras to record whilst the vehicle's parked up. So if it has a good parking mode, that'll be quite good as well if I do park it in an area where I can leave the dash cam in the car. So all those things considered, I've spent a good few months looking for a suitable dash cam and I've finally found one. I think it's a real corker and I'd like to show it to you here today. So this footage comes to you courtesy of Shaky Cam. I'll show you where it is here. It's up behind the rearview mirror. Remove it like that. It's got a magnetic mount. Now that's a good idea. So I'll just click it back on there and I'll show you what it looks like from the front. Now the model name of this is the DDPi M6 Plus, but I'll have links to that in the video description. Now talking of links and things, on my website here, techmoan.com, if you go to the top right, I've got a bit about what's the best dash cam because people always ask me this and there's a lot of them in there because they do fit into different categories. The small ones are at the top for example a good small camera with no screen on it that could be used as a dash cam is the mobius camera now that's been around for a while a good few years now so the camera that i'm demonstrating in this video does have quite a few more features than that but that's a lot cheaper as well the next one down i've got the mini 0806 but notice i've got a warning about reliability issues i like that camera however lots of people that used it longer than i did have got in touch to say that it tended to fail after a while due to the mount being wobbly and the internal battery and things and then the last mini camera I've got on there, or small camera, is the Vantru N1. Great camera all around, good video quality, can't fault it at all. Lots of people bought it after seeing the review, they like it as well. But I'm looking for something even more compact than that, and with a few more features for my small car. Let me talk about what those features are. So we've got the usual things, great day and night video quality, good sound quality, and I mentioned that it has to be compact, it doesn't have to have a screen on it, that's not too important. But I would like this one to have Wi-Fi. I've shown you the quick release mount, I'll show you that more later on. I like the idea of having the cables neatly hidden away, not sort of hanging down from the thing. It's got to be under £100. Now, my car has now got that new battery pack in that I reviewed a few weeks ago, so I'd like it to have a good parking mode function. And we might as well throw GPS in there as well, because, hey, why not? Now, obviously, the camera that does meet all those requirements is the DDPi M6 Plus. But before I got to that, I had to go through quite a few false starts. I started off on this quest perhaps over six months ago, and I went through a few cameras before getting to that one. I just want to briefly talk about those first. So this one looked all right. I thought that'll be OK. Trouble is, it has a bracket on it, which once it's fixed to your windscreen means that the camera's fixed to your car, unless you undo the bolt in the bracket, which is a bit of a bad design idea. Also, the GPS antenna was on a wire, so that was one more wire hanging out of it. And the wires hang out of the side of it as well, which means that it doesn't look particularly nice in your windscreen of your car. It doesn't hide away as well as I'd want it to. And the app for that one hadn't been translated very well, and a lot of the things that it didn't make any sense. So that was the first camera that didn't suit my requirements. So the next one I got was this thing. Now, this is the Rock. Lots of people have asked me to review I say lots, a few people have asked me to review this because it looks interesting you look at it you think that's an interesting little dash cam little metal cube with a kind of bracket that goes on the top of it a pretty nice setup as to what you get in the box the trouble is it just doesn't work very well it might look neat but the heavy weight cube hangs down on that mount and that little mount is only held onto your windscreen by a little tiny uh, piece of adhesive on the end of it and you can only twist the mount forward and back so if you get it pointing slightly to the left or to the right or at a diagonal you can't change it at all so the 
whole thing's let down by the mount. And also when you try and take it off the mount, the mount falls off the windscreen. Uh, just a bad design, that one. And the app was a bit bizarre as well. Oh, and the wires hang out to the side of it, which kind of ruins the whole point of the thing looking neat. And it's very obvious from the outside as well, if you look in the windscreen. So we then ended up getting, I say we, me, ended up getting the DDPi M6C. Now, this seemed to be the ideal camera. Everything seemed to be going well for this one. I like the mount, the app seemed to work well on it and generally makes sense. It has a magnetic mount. I thought that was a brilliant idea. Look at that, it just sticks on like that. The only problem is the video quality was really very soft and in places if you were to drive into the sun for example it went really dark but the big achilles heel for this one as well as the soft and poor video quality was the fact that mount vibrated just have a listen to this So unfortunately the magnetic mount, while being a good idea, meant that the camera vibrated because it just kept moving about on that magnet. However, I did like the M6C, so I went and got an M6 Plus. Now this is the top of the range DD Pi camera. I like the features of the M6C, but the M6 Plus threw a few more in besides. It's got a 140 degree lens, you can see the resolution and frame rate at the bottom there. Wi-Fi of course, iOS and Android apps only for this. Uh, Built-in GPS on this one, the other one didn't have that one. So Supposedly supports up to 64 gig micro SD card and it's got a little wireless remote control as well I'll show you what that's for in a bit you can see the remote at the bottom there so we've got the usual USB A to micro B leader which has also come with some cable ties there to hold it neatly in your car we've got a car power adapter which has a 2.1 amp and a 1 amp output on there you can use your own of course if you want that's a little remote control if you press that the camera will take a snapshot and a little short 11 second video right here's the camera with the mounts let me show you how this goes together so here's the mount that goes into the camera there's the magnetic end on there and we've got the usb plug on the back there and it's got a ball joint now this part stays on your windscreen this is the adhesive part so this disc stays at the top of your windscreen and you put the mount onto that if you want to take it into and out of your car you can leave the mount in your car of course as well and then the camera itself goes on the magnet at the bottom there now the fault with the other one rattling has been solved by having longer arms on that mount there it means it doesn't rattle around the same so they've realized what was wrong fixed it and this one now doesn't rattle or at least it didn't for me and i've got quite a vibrating car so i think if it doesn't rattle for me i think you'll be okay so good idea that they've actually fixed that and they've kept the magnetic mount as well they haven't reverted to doing something where you have to press a button now on the back here that's where your micro sd card goes in there's a little reset button in there as well but that's the only other button on the camera the rest of it is button free you've got a lens on the front and some leds on the top now the instruction booklet for this it's okay it gives you some pictures sort of gives you a general pointer tells you how to connect up over wi-fi what the password is uh, download the app all that kind of stuff it doesn't go into an awful lot of detail though it's very brief i'll talk you through some bits in here though this temperature the operating temperature you can see at the top there minus 20 to plus 70 degrees c it mentions continuous firmware updates it'll download new firmware over 3g so make sure you got a good data contract and upload those to the camera once you're connected to it over wi-fi there's the rest of the specs press pause if you want to read through those now notice it does have a tiny battery in there but it's not for recording with it's just for sort of saving settings and things like that and powering it down you don't use it to record off that tiny battery it lasts a couple of minutes right i've put some power into this i've put a 32 gig micro sd card into it so look at the lights come on and let's just have a listen for a second Yeah, that's the startup message. You better get used to that because it's going to carry on doing it. The red light indicates there's power, the green light flashing indicates it's recording, and the blue light flashes until it gets a GPS lock, then it goes solid blue and says this. GPS now some people might find those announcements a little bit quirky i actually like them but i suggest keeping them on because once you've got the camera in your car mounted in the windscreen you can't really see those leds very well so the best way to know that it's recording is leaving the announcement switched on so that when it starts recording it'll say Now, if you get this camera, you will need an iOS or Android smartphone or similar device to connect up to it because you need to change the settings once you first get it. 
for example, put the time and date into it. Choose what video mode you want. Now, once you've got it connected up using the password that's shown in the manual, download the app, which you can find by searching for DDPi on the App Store. It all looks like it's going to be in a foreign language, but it isn't. Uh, not all of it, anyway. Now, the first thing you have to do, of course, get the camera pointed in the right direction. And you can do that by looking at the live video feed in the app, get the camera lined up exactly how you want. Now, we're going to the settings at the top here. So I'll just click that button. Right, the first thing you can do, change the name of the device on the Wi-Fi network and also change the password for it so other people can't get into your camera. And then below that, we can choose how loud we want the beeps in the announcements, whether we want to record sound when we're recording video, whether we want to capture an 11 second video clip at the same time it takes a photo. And that's when you press that little remote control button. Enable eDog, that's your overlay on the bottom of the screen, the time and date and things, whether you want that on or off. And now the image quality level, we've got three choices here 1440p 1080p or 720 i chose the top one for all my video clips and then the next setting for video is the aspect ratio now my preference is for the bottom one of these i'll explain more when i play the video to you later on and then the only other settings we've got are in this advanced settings menu now the top two things on here are to do with parking mode so we've got park guard and time lapse video i'll show you both of those time and date display that's whether you want it showing on the video whether you want the speed showing on the video in kilometers per hour or whether you want to switch it off whether you want that start song on or off and whether you want the g sensor sensitivity set to high medium low or off i used low and haven't had any accidentally locked files now if you want to do anything with the sd card in the camera click on camera storage management you can format the card in there it'll also tell you how much storage you've used on the card and when you used it as well now if i go in the camera info at the bottom here it tells you the firmware that's on my camera at the top right there it's changed firmwares, I think, three times since I've got this by over-the-air firmware updates. Right, let's have a look at some samples I've shot with the camera. And as usual, I've got some clips available to download if you want to look at them in their original quality. Now, I'm going to show you quite a few different situations here. And when I edit between scenes, I'm going to put a blur wipe on like that there. So, you know, that's not the camera. That's me editing scenes together. Now, I wanted to show you this one in particular because I'm going from indoors or underground outside here. You can see the light, but it adjusts to it quickly. But the particular thing that I liked about this one is how quick the GPS locked on. Look at the time, 2.31 and 47 seconds. That's when I could see daylight. And just look how quickly it takes for the GPS to get a lock. GPS now that is approximately a minute and considering the car is still under cover pretty much here and had been parked up for a number of hours, I think that is a really good result. Now hopefully this is coming across well on YouTube because I really like the video quality of this camera. It's lovely, clear and sharp, edge to edge. Look what happens when I go into these shadows. The camera copes with that fine, no problem at all. And also look at the detail here, how you can see all the vehicle registration numbers. Very, very sharp indeed. Now another thing I want to point out, as I drive past this bus that turns left here, just as I get past it, that's where two clips join together, approximately there somewhere. Now you won't be able to find out where because there's no obvious link between them, no join. Uh, you join two clips together and it's frame perfect. You don't lose any frames, there's no overlapping frames, there's no sound dropout. They just join together, absolutely perfect. Now the video clips are three minutes. You can't change that. Every clip is three minutes long, but that's fine because it works fine. So why would you bother messing around with it? Just a quick word about the reflections that you can see on the windscreen. That's down to my car and not the camera. It's the angle of my windscreen. It's the color of my dashboard. Every car is different in this regard. People get too hung up, I feel, over the reflections on dash cams. Remember, you've got a dash cam to record what happens in the event of an accident. You're not shooting a Hollywood movie where you're pretending that there's no windscreen there. Yeah, there's a windscreen there. And if it smashes because this HGV smashes into it, I'm sure I'm gonna have pretty good video quality to to demonstrate that. Now I mentioned it earlier but just for clarity the speed indicator at the bottom of the screen is only available in kilometers per hour and yes it can be switched off. 
Now earlier on, you remember I set the video to record in this aspect ratio with the black bars at the top and bottom. I could have recorded full screen if I wanted, but my preference is to do it this way because I feel that the bit rate that you're using for the video is concentrated on the center part of the image. You're not wasting bit rate on encoding the clouds at the top or your dashboard at the bottom. No, you're using it to record what's going on on the road, which will make it even clearer. And if you had to pause a video to look at a registration number, you've got more chance of it being legible. Okay, let's take a look at some night footage as well as audio recorded on the M6 Plus's built-in microphone. Okay, so I'm just going to say a few words here to the camera whilst the car's waiting at these traffic lights because I'm sure once I get the car going it might be a little bit harder to hear me because this is quite a, a noisy car on the inside. So here we are now setting off. Hopefully you can still hear me. But you see, once I get going, the engine noise starts to come through into the cabin. Right, I'll just butt in on myself there. The sound quality on this camera is fine. It might sound a little bit muffled there, but it's down to the car more than anything else. There's nothing wrong with it. One thing particularly impressive is the night quality. Look at the time at the bottom left there. That's correct, 10.36 in the evening. And the light that you can see in the sky wasn't really visible to my eyes. I could see there's a kind of slight tinge to the sky, but not to this degree. It really does look lovely and clear. Obviously, this has got some great lenses on there to be able to get night footage like this. And just look on the left here. These people were hardly visible to me, but the camera caught them there, creeping along the edge of the pavement. So excellent i can't fault this as far as video quality goes at night time either i mean this was a longer road with very poor lighting and also this section here was a longer road with no lighting at all and just look at those colors from the headlights you can see the color of the grass you can see the sunset colors on the right there the, the red lights by the way in the windscreen again that's reflections of things on top of my dashboard the uh, hazard warning lights and things like that but yeah absolutely brilliant nighttime quality on this camera and of course during the daytime as we saw it can cope with lighting changes between driving into the sun or going into this car park here you can see how quickly it adjusts there so you can see exactly what's going on i've had cameras that take 10 seconds or more to figure out what's going on or just go completely dark obviously things have improved over the years and this camera's got all those improvements built in now this seems like a good time to use those parking modes. So I'm going to demonstrate park guard and time-lapse video to you. I'm going to show time-lapse video first, but I've got to point out again, if you want to use either of these two modes, you're going to have to have your camera continuously powered either by a hard wire kit, or in my case, I'm using this battery pack, which will record for a couple of days or so. Right, so the first thing you do, of course, you park up now remember the camera's got no buttons on it itself you don't have to press anything there's nothing you have to do just drive as normal park up get out of your car and walk off now look at the time there 10 48 approximately five minutes later the camera goes into time lapse mode on its own and this is what that looks like nothing happening to start but look at the clock at the bottom left there you see it moving faster it records one frame per second so a 75 minute time lapse is about 470 megabytes which is a three minute file so an hour and 15 minutes fits into a 470 meg file which is three minutes long when you watch it back so you can see all this stuff going on while the car's parked i'm not here of course this is over a course of a few hours and uh, not everyone is brilliant at parking in car parks now that car that came in there let's just have a look at that now it, it didn't crash into me but let's imagine that i came back and there's a big scratch all down that side so i'll look back at the video when i get back and i'm watching it slowly here let's see what we could see if that car crashed into me which it didn't so don't worry about it but let's have a look very slowly you can see the reg number you can see the people in the vehicle you better see my vehicle sort of shift when you like bounce over to the left if that pushed into it so that gives you an idea as to what use of park guard is obviously it's got to be something that happens at the front of the vehicle or you could get two of these cameras stick one out of the back but you get the idea as to how useful uh, parking guard is or time lapse video in this case because not everyone is brilliant at parking just have a look at this that's a hash of a job well done you have to get out and help them why did they park next to me there was loads of empty space i don't get it at all right anyway this is another place where i parked so at 11.06 I parked and at 11.40 I got back and there was a car parked 
pointed towards me. This is a one-way street facing the other way, the way that I'm facing. So I wanted to know how that white BMW got there. So again, looked at the video that happened whilst I was away from the vehicle to see how it got there. And yeah, it drove up the one-way street the wrong way. What's well, a BMW? It's allowed to do those kind of things. So that was time lapse. Let's have a look at Park Guard. So Park Guard is a bit of an unusual thing. It took me a while to figure out what was going on. Let me show you one of the videos that happened while I was away. Did you hear that chime at the beginning there? That's a park guard video. Basically, the cameras decide to wake up while I'm not around, 11.14, record a three minute clip as normal, and then go back to sleep and start recording time lapse again. Let's have another look at one of those. Now, I'm thinking, hold on, the cameras woke up, what's going on? And someone shook the car, tried to break in, uh, bashed into it, what's happening here? And then I realized that it was occurring whenever I went back to the car and unlocked it with my remote key fob. So there's no vibration there, it's just a sound. So that got me thinking, I wonder what sound set off these other park guard recordings. So looking back at the time lapse that occurs immediately before, if you slow it down, you can see the last thing that went past was this car, which will presumably have loud exhaust. And similarly on this clip, when I slow this one down, we can see again another vehicle which will have a loud exhaust. Now my car's convertible, so obviously those sounds are traveling into the cabin. It might not happen on all cars, and of course you can, if you want, switch the park guard off, but I'm definitely leaving it on. You see, I think it's a good idea. If someone was to bash into your car, that would create a loud sound and therefore you'd have a full motion video of the aftermaths of that incident. So you'd have a time lapse leading up to it and then the park guard would get set off by the noise and then you'd get all these people on full video looking at the front of their car, your car, thinking, oh, we best scarper before this guy comes back and driving off. So when you get back into your car, perhaps half an hour later, you realize the front's all smashed in. You can look back at the video and you'll have a full video of what happened in the aftermath of the incident and you'll have a time-lapse video of what happened in the run-up to the incident. And you can't really say fairer than that. Again, I've got to stress, if you want to use any of these parking mode features, you've got to have a continuous power supply to your dash cam. But I think it's definitely worth wiring one of those in with this camera, especially considering that it automatically enters and leaves those modes. So you park up, it goes into time-lapse mode, you set off, it goes back into normal video recording mode. You don't have to press any buttons at all. I think it's a brilliant system. Now there's no USB port on the camera itself and in my opinion the quickest and easiest way to get your video out of the camera and onto your computer is to take the micro SD card out of the camera and put it into an SD card adapter and if your computer's got an SD card reader plug it straight into that and if it doesn't plug the SD card into a USB SD card reader and then plug that into a USB port. Now once you've got your SD card into your computer you can see that on there there are four clearly labeled folders. You've got video, photo, thumb and GPS. Now in the video folder that's where your normal videos and your time lapse reside. Now the video files I was recording were at 2560 by 1440 24 five frames per second and those ones are three minutes in length and approximately 237 megabytes each so by my calculations that means you can fit approximately six hours 45 minutes on a 32 gig card and remember according to the specs this camera supposedly will support a 64 gig card now if we look at the next folder down which are photos those are the ones that get taken when you press that little remote control shutter button it takes a still photo which is just a video frame out of a video the thumbs folder is just something used for navigation within the app and it contains compressed thumbnails of your videos and then finally in the gps folder obviously that's the gps data now i'll try and show you how this app works to the best of my abilities anyway you can see at the top there, I'm scrolling through time. Those are those little thumbnails that the camera's stored on the memory card. It enables you to get to a particular period. You can see a picture of it. You can then stretch it out at the bottom, how much of that period you want to download. And then you can click download and it'll save it to your phone over Wi-Fi, which does take a while as video files often do over Wi-Fi. But once it's there, it's now in my phone, in the app. Now looking through the other files in the app here, we can see we've got a lot of 11 second ones there. And then the other ones are photos. Now you see the 11 second ones, that's what happens when you press that little remote button. Now I'll play you one of these files. They're automatically downloaded to your phone, so you don't have to copy those across, but you'll hear the point at which I press the shutter button on this clip. So I'll just be quiet for a second. 
And there you go, right at the end of the clip. The other sound, by the way, was the radio. So effectively, it records about 10 seconds before you press the button and one second after. Now, you see, I've got a longer one here. That's because I pressed the button a couple of times close together. Now, if we look at the video that I just downloaded into the app, this is what that looks like. So that looks fine, as you can see, nice and clear. And of course, once it's in your phone, then you can share it and do all sorts of weird things. In fact, talking of which, they've got a bit of a kind of social network type thing at the bottom here. If you go into there, now I don't really understand what's going on here, but you seem to be able to create an account and then share your little clips with other people in this kind of network of video files. I think it works a little bit like Snapchat or something, but I'm not really into all that kind of stuff. But there you go. That's what that's about. I haven't really used it. The other thing that you got in here is maps it stores those gps data as we saw before but also goes back quite a lot further than your videos do so you can look at journeys you've taken quite a while ago how long they took how far they were and you can even zoom in on the maps and things if you want to have a look at them in a little bit more detail see the exact route you took so look nice little feature there as well there's a lot in this app and you really will have to play around with it to find out exactly what all these features are i can't demonstrate them all to you but suffice it to say the camera works fine without the app but if you want to use the app to get into all these different things and you'll find there's an awful lot there now it's pretty obvious but i best say it. of course to be able to connect up to your camera the camera needs to be on the wi-fi is always on when the camera is switched on but you have to be within range of the camera, which is your usual sort of Wi-Fi distance, nothing special about it. So if you really want to connect up to it for long periods of time, perhaps bring the camera into the house, take the mount off the windscreen, plug the USB lead into the mount so you can power the camera whilst you're in your house. Now, the only thing that I would like them to change a little bit is this button here. Now, I do love the idea of having this remote button. You just tap it. It takes a still image and an 11 second video and copies them to your phone automatically if you've got it set up for that. But the only problem is it's just 11 seconds. I wish it was a little bit longer because quite often I've seen something, thought, oh, I'd like to copy that to my phone, press the button. It's been too late. If it could do maybe 30 seconds or so, that'd be a nice feature. But I understand why they've done it. It's to do with file sizes and things. Of course, features like that can be updated through firmware updates i've already had a number of those to this device since i've got it and those are downloaded over a mobile network and copied across over wi-fi but of course you're not going to lose anything you're not going to lose any videos you can always copy them across to your phone whilst you're out and about there's no problem with that and that's something that you can't do unless you've got wi-fi so for example if you've driven to the other side of the country but you saw something interesting halfway copy it to your phone because you'll lose it otherwise on your journey back so there you go, that's the DDPi M6 Plus. That's the camera that I've chosen out of all the ones I've tested to put in my car. And I can see it staying there for quite a while. I can't see what else could come along that I would like more than this. Now, if this is my last dash cam review for a while, at least we've got out on a high. And if you want to purchase one of these, I've got links to buy this in the video description. That'll take you through to the place where I bought mine from on eBay. And maybe I'll stick some Amazon links there if you prefer those. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.